Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning. Depends upon where you're at. Bill Gustin with Miami-Dade Fire Rescue Department. Uh, coming to you from the Miami, Florida area. Our topic today is going to be overhead doors, which will also uh, include roll-down security shutters as well. We have a spirited group here, and we have a, uh, a special guest, a subject matter expert, uh, Chief Steve Shaw from the uh, Fort Lauderdale Fire Department. Uh, I've got a few things to say, but uh, we're going to start off with a shout out for Key Hose. That's keyhose.com. Uh, there's a trend in the building industry right now with these towers. Uh, we're in an urban area where you have a very small lot size. Uh, you'll have tall buildings that uh, each floor maybe have one or two apartments. You have very little public hallway or landings to lay out your hose. You're going to have to have some type of hose that you can lay out in a coil fashion or something uh, in a very confined space. You're going to have to have some type of hose with uh, remarkable kink resistance in order to lay that hose out in a tight confinement like that. If you don't, you are going to be sunk with kinks. Now, Key has a lot of different uh, products. Uh, my department uses the two-inch hose, uh, Key Combat Ready with an inch and an eighth tip for our high-rise operations, again, maximum flow uh, with minimum friction loss. We get the best we can at whatever available outlet pressure we can have. Uh, I recently had my hands on some of their True ID 2.25, two and a quarter inch hose. Um, didn't really get that much experience, but I'm gonna defer to our, our brother on the West Coast, Daryl Liggins, Daryl, can you give us your experience with the key true ID two and a quarter inch hose? Well, I flowed it last week and all I can say is hold on to your hats because this is going to be a game changer in the fire industry. For departments that are looking to flow no more than about 265 GPM out of their two and a half inch hose, this is uh, it feels to me much more like a large inch and three quarter than it did like a two and a half. Two and a half is a very uh, interesting hose size in the fire service because we use it for supply and attack. This is made purely as a hand line. It's constructed like a hand line. And it was about 80 pounds lighter charged with uh, full of water because it's holding less water. But that inch and a quarter is just double the diameter for, of an inch and an eighth tip, and it's just ideally matched. It really surprised me. So if you get a chance to try this, go to the key booth at FDIC and check it out. Fellas and ladies, you know, there, we used, used to have really only two choices for standpipe operations. I'll lump inch and a half and inch and three quarter together, Daryl, but also inch and a half or two and a half. That is no longer the case. The fire hose industry, has created some uh, hybrids, some prototypes, uh, and, and put them on the market like the two and a quarter inch, that uh, you now have choices. You now can find hose that approximates, not equals, but approximates the flow of a two and a half inch line, but with the weight that is closer to and with the same skill sets and number of personnel as in uh, as an inch and three quarter. So you're, if you're in the market, you're looking for hose for standpipe operations or whatever. And it's not just key. It's the whole entire hose industry. There's more out there and available than there was just a few years ago. Uh, let's move on. I've got a couple. I got a tribute that I want to give a little bit later here. But let's go ahead. We're going to move on to our, our, our special guest, Steve Shaw. And Steve, if you could tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and, and why you're why you are invited today to be here, and it's not just your good look. Well, uh, uh, first of all, thank you for for having me. It's it's an honor to be here amongst y'all. Um, my name is Steve Shaw. I'm the Battalion Chief of Training and Special Operations for Fort Lauderdale Fire Rescue. Been with Fort Lauderdale just shy of 20 years. I'm um, also the chair of the Broward County Training Chiefs, the Training and Education Subcommittee. Um, I, I think that the main reason I'm here is, first of all, I don't mean to blow your skirt up there, Cap, but I'm kind of following your footsteps. I'm kind of taking that torch that you started with garage door and overhead door forceful entry some time back. And I'm just grabbing that torch and running with it while I'm pouring gasoline on top of it. Um, so thank you for starting this. I'm just trying to, to just 
see what else I can learn. And I will tell you that every time I think I found something new, a new tactic, a new technique, a new, hey, this works better than this. It seems like every time I, I have that conversation with you, it seems like you always jump the gun and say, oh, you just tried that and you try this. So I never seem to get ahead of you, but I'm trying. Um, just trying to do right by you. So thank you for, for inviting me. Um, but uh, to answer your question, um, uh, this is a, a passion project of mine for some time now. Uh, since I became into training, um, one of the first things I wanted to do was kind of focus on a garage door forcible entry, especially in the, the South Florida area, where our doors are a lot more heavily reinforced than in most places across the country. And I feel that we've done a pretty good job, not only training our own folk, but determining what the best practices are specific to our area. And I'm just uh, excited to be here. I'm excited to talk tactics and talk uh, shop. But uh, once again, I'm just uh, I'm just honored to be here with you all. So thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, Steve. All right, we'll get to some more students a little later. Captain Mike, sir. Yes, sir, Bill. Mike Dugan, FDNY retired. Damn glad to be here. And Mike, I would probably bet my next paycheck that uh, if you would cut more overhead roll down doors than uh, anybody here in this uh, in our hangout. I'm um, pretty confident with that because you spent most of your career on a lot of busy ladder companies. So uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And then, uh, well, we have a stranger here with us. Uh, the chief of department, Florissant uh, Valley Fire Protection District, is it not? I don't think you've been on, uh, Jason, since you have become chief of department. So, Jason? Yeah, I'm Jason Holbelman uh, with the Florissant Valley Fire Protection District in the Midwest, uh, just outside of St. Louis City. And it's good to be back. Uh, I've been busy the last several months, and I missed you guys. Uh, and you're very qualified and deserving of that promotion, my friend. And I'm, I'm very happy for you and you, for your department. And then we've got uh, our friend Daryl, who uh, I just had talked a little bit about the key hose. Uh, Daryl, you want to go ahead and just go ahead and introduce yourself there just briefly? My computer cut out. I don't know if you're talking to me. Uh, my name yeah. is Daryl Ligon. I'm a captain in the Oakland, California Fire Department, working on an engine company in the Fruitvale District. Very good. Very good. Um, uh, Clark uh, Lamping, and um, we, we know who you are, Clark. Uh, and you're the guy that uh, everybody goes to the Las Vegas Strip and you buy them a beer. Uh, but what they don't, I don't know that they've met Derek. So if you could introduce Derek and then let Derek um, uh, say a little bit about himself. Yes, sir. I brought with me uh, Derek Sutherland. He is first from Georgia. Now he's with uh, Clark County Fire Department. He teaches hands-on training with East Coast Rescue Solutions at FDIC. And he is the Station 11B Authority on Forcible Entry and quite possibly the Clark County Fire Department Authority on Forcible Entry. Uh, that's pretty generous. Uh, my name is Derek Sutherland. I do work for the Clark County Fire Department here in Las Vegas. Uh, I did start my career out in Cobb County, Georgia, and uh, I am honored and have had the opportunity the past few years to be teaching at FDIC uh, in the hands-on training for forcible entry with East Coast Rescue Solutions. And it's, uh, you guys get a chance, those watching, come check it out because lots of these opportunities, for some of these things we're going to discuss today will, will be available to you there. All right, very good. Thanks for being on today, Derek. And great to see you again, uh, Chief Hall Halton. Well, Billy, why don't you uh, join me in uh, for a moment, and uh, before we uh, go too far, uh, and um, talk a little bit about our friend Greg. Okay, I have a picture right here, a mask card uh, that I got for you, and I'm just going to hold it up here. Okay, uh, we lost a giant in the fire service uh, just recently, our brother Greg Havel. And when I mean brother, I mean he is a, a brother firefighter, but he is also, a lot of people don't know this, was a Franciscan friar. He was a Christian brother. He, for years, he has written the construction concerns column in the fire engineering webpage, a man way ahead of his time. Uh, he didn't want to write for the magazine. He wanted to reach out to especially our younger folks. The man was always the smartest guy in the room. Uh, his uh, He wrote in very small and digestible and easy understandable 
bulletins that you could read like in maybe five minutes on a topic. It, and it was like almost a weekly um, uh, article that he would have uh, a true gentleman, uh, frankly, the closest thing to a saint I've ever known as a mortal man. I also want to thank the firefighters in Burlington, Wisconsin, the Burlington, Wisconsin uh, Fire Department and the area in the fire departments in that area. I attended Greg's services and these folks reached out to me and treated me like I was one of their own, allowed me to participate in uh, the uh, color guard or honor guard, I should say. Um, Greg, uh, who's no longer with us, is going to continue to teach firefighters for decades and decades and decades to come because of his lasting legacy with the construction concerns. So um, we lost a great one. And uh, I just thank the good Lord myself to, uh, to have been his friend and uh, to have been his student. Yeah, and uh, just to chime in with Bill, um, met Greg 15 years ago, 14 years ago, when I first took this job, went to Wisconsin to a talk. Walked up to me and said, "Hey, I write. A, I'm interested in building construction. I'm the fire. <clears throat> I'm the fire marshal here." And I said, "Well, great." He said, "I'd like to write for you." I said, "Okay, great." So he uh, sent us a short piece, and um, it was really good. And we put it up on the site, uh, Pete and I, and my good friend Glenn Corbett. And and Glenn is a, 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 a amazing guy and, and and one of Greg's dearest and closest friends. But at the time, they didn't know one another. And Greg is our uh, so, so anyway, Glenn, who's this guy? Who's this guy? What's he talking about? What's he know? You know, and, and uh, in true Greg fashion, he was just like, well, you know, just uh, just interested, would like to write. And so he did. And um, uh, we would get two pieces a month. I mean, it was just it was like clockwork. And as Bill said, he was very uh, diligent and very focused and he was very humble. And uh, we're going to publish his works. We're going to publish his works. His mom's 96, and she's still with us. And we're going to make her the beneficiary. Uh, and, and so you'll be able to get all of Greg's works in, in one place. Also, uh, Frank, our good friend Frank Ritchie lost his dad last week. We wanted everybody to know that. Frank is one of our hosts on the Politics and Tactics show. And you all know Frank. Uh, so our sympathies are with Frank. Um, tragic loss of his dad last week. Uh, we also wanted to say a quick thank you, I do, and my sisters, uh, for the tremendous outpouring from the fire service from my mom. Um, in particular, uh, my good friend Mike Dugan, who uh, stayed by my family's side uh, during this long hospice battle that my mom put up. Um, many, many times Mike showed up at the house to drop off food or help us move mom or help us move whatever and uh, help move me. Um, <laughs> which those of you that know me, sometimes that's a chore. Um, so thank you. Um, the kindness of this uh, family of firefighters is just unbelievable. And so please remember that. And, and please remember that space is filling up in all of our hot classes and we don't want you to be left out. And you know, we've got, uh, you know, uh, our, our friend here talking about roll up doors. We'll be teaching about it from, uh, and, and has for the last five years as a hot instructor. And he can tell you that, you know, at the, in a couple of weeks, I have to tell people you can't get in. Uh, several classes are very close to filling up. So please, and watch your in basket. They're doing all kinds of specials this year, which is kind of cool. We got some new marketing uh, folk who are pretty creative folk and um, doing really, really neat stuff. So look for these daily specials they're going to be doing, which are just amazing. And they're like daily specials. And they sent me the list, and they're really cool. You can get stuff like a um, a, a, a free uh, Mike Dugan mustache to, to put on, so you look really, really cool. No, I'm just kidding. But stuff like you know discounts and, and, and savings and books and uh, networking stuff. So that's really, really cool. Please, uh, many of us will be out at EMS today next week in National Harbor. Not Baltimore, but National Harbor, which is a different place. Really, really cool place at the EMS Today conference. Still some space open in some of the workshops there. Uh, Lasky will be there, a bunch of other cool people. So please join us at National Harbor next week. Gordon Graham will be there, myself, Angie uh, Hughes, uh, Mike McAvoy, Romney Duckworth, just a cadre of great fire people. Donna Summers from, from uh, Chicago, Dan DeGrice, Deanna Ali, just some really, really cool people. And one last thing, 
uh, to, to share before we go into the discussion about doors, which are really, really critical. Uh, there's a good piece up on the site right now about roll-up doors and, and forcible entry. But hot off the presses, this is the very first copy. Uh, hopefully everybody can see that. This is a book by our friends from O2X. Paul McCullough, Adam LaRue, Bryce Long. These are some amazing guys. Uh, uh, Paul and Adam, former Navy SEALs, uh, but also brilliant geniuses, uh, uh, SEAL officers, um, and, and really, really neat, neat guys. Uh, I, knew, I, knew their I know their commanding officer, their former commanding officer, Rear Admiral Scott Moore, and, and the praise that he has for these two officers uh, was off the charts. Uh, you know, rarely, uh, folks always say good stuff about one another that they serve with, but his, uh, his estimation of these two gentlemen as officers uh, is, is second to none. His esteem for them, his love for them, uh, his, his, um, his, his praise for their, their service to our country. But their service continues in, in this book. And, and this is an amazing, amazing uh, uh, product, Human Performance for Tactical Athletes, written by people who really know what they're talking about. And, and uh, it's available in pre-order. It, it's hot off the presses, so they'll be flying off the shelves. Uh, both Adam and Paul and Bryce, uh, all, all three of them will be at FDIC, so please go see them. Um, this stuff matters, right? Uh, we did a webcast the other day about stroke and, and heart attack and the five causes of sudden death. Everything, every one of those causes is addressed not to the medical treatment level, but to the preventative level in this book. How do we keep ourselves spiritually, emotionally, physically connected and healthy while doing this incredibly demanding uh, job? Uh, while, 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 while putting it all out there, how do we get to be as old as, the, as Bill Gustin and hopefully in better shape at the end of that run? I'm just kidding. But, but Bill's in fantastic shape. He really is. So how do we get there? You know, and, 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 and my editorial this month is about life isn't fair. Random stuff's going to happen to you. You might get sick. You might, things are still going to happen. There's no silver bullet. But this is, this is about personal responsibility and accountability, something that's really lacking in, in our society today where everybody else is responsible for every part of your life except you. Well, here's a clue, Sparky. At the end of the day, it's up to you to take care of yourself. And so I, I highly recommend if you're a training officer, if you're a firefighter who's serious, if you're, if you're someone who has any responsibility for anyone else who's doing this job, order this book and, and, and pay attention. Sorry to yell, but you know that not taking care of yourself is probably the stupidest thing you can possibly do. Because if you dislike yourself that much, so is everybody else. Um, you know, the, the, the best way to, to show people you care is to care for yourself. And, and, and that way you can help others better. Uh, and, and so, sorry to yell at you, but it's what I do for a living. Um, now, now to our discussion. Well, I'm just going to add something to that. We're in a unique profession here, a boss. Uh, we, as firefighters, know that there are fates worse than death. And stroke many times is, and and uh, uh, yeah, pr prevention is is key. Steve Shaw, I have pictures, but I think what I'm going to do is I, I want you to go into an examination of um, of overhead doors. I'll just briefly relate a, an experience. Um, uh, we had a fire in a a warehouse bay. And um, a heavy amount of fire with flaming liquid molten goo coming out of the doorway towards us. It turned out to be melted monofilament fishing line that were on these giant spools. And uh, before we could get a chance to get, well, the fire was too great to put a pike pole in the, in the overhead doorway. Uh, but by the time we got it in a position where we were close to the door, knocked down the fire. This thing came down like a guillotine, and doors in South Florida are extremely heavy. And I'm going to let our guest, Steve, explain why we have a special challenge in South Florida and what his department, my department, has done uh, to adapt our techniques for handling these types of wind-rated doors. Go ahead, Steve. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate the. Uh 
the answer there. Um, and I'm not sure exactly where to start, but I'll kind of go through just to why kind of I'm so passionate about this particular topic. Um, when I first came on the job, maybe a year one or two, I was ordered to take down a garage door. And I guess at the time, for some whatever reason, I didn't have the uh, the wherewithal to attack that door. And the the absolute the the I, I made such a mess out of that door, taking it down. It was embarrassing. And I even don't like looking back and thinking about what I did to that door. It was just, it looked horrible. Uh, I, I promised myself that I would learn a lot. I learned how to properly understand building instructions and rotary saws and forcible entry and get better. So that if that was ever asked of me again, I'm going to make my department look good. And I know how to do it with, with professionalism. And um, since that time, um, I've gotten definitely better. Uh, done a lot of teaching on the topic, followed your articles from the beginning. And through that time, up until I got in training, um, you know, especially in the South Florida area, as you know, as everybody, a lot of people know, in our neck of the woods, when you talk about those sectional doors, they're the most, probably the most rigid doors, the most reinforced doors, the, the meatiest doors you'll find around. So for us, forceful entry on those doors, it's not as simple as just sometimes cutting triangle or cutting once or twice and you're done. There's a, there's a definitely, and I'd love that they're showing those pictures right there. There's right. definitely an art to cutting these doors. Um, so when I got into training, one of the first things I wanted to do was kind of just take that on as a passion project and met up with a garage door company locally, um, developed a great public private partnership. Uh, they built a prop for us and we've been cutting garage doors over there for the last five, six years over and over again. I, I've kind of lost count of how many doors have been cutting. So in the beginning, it was just about practicing that tactic. But what we saw over time was that the crews that were coming in, and whether it was neighboring agencies, our own folk, um, we saw some some opportunities there to help our folk get better. We saw people not really uh, being as astute on the rotary saw as they should be, um, and we um, kind of tackled that. We saw a lot of um, lack of knowledge on what was behind those doors. They didn't realize sometimes that these doors were no longer reinforced with just maybe two and three quarter or three inch reinforcements, but upwards of five and even greater reinforcements behind those. Plus the fact that they're insulated, plus the fact that they might have some sort of exterior uh, piece of wood in the front for decoration purposes. And like you said, it's, it's misleading on how heavy those doors really are. You mentioned the door that crashed uh, at that scene recently. You know, I, I don't think these folk realize is those springs behind those doors are holding up a lot of weight between two, three, four hundred pounds in some case. And, you know, it brings me to another conversation that maybe we'll have later that sometimes it may be safer to pry before, or pry before you try than try before you pry. Um, but anyway, going back to the, the doors, um, we what I what I thought was interesting and I still kind of am fascinated by it is, you know, where are people learning how to tackle these doors? Where do they learn how to do what they're doing? And I started asking a lot of questions, asking a lot of folks what they were doing. What we saw a lot of was the traditional triangle-shaped cuts. Now, I'm not saying that they won't work, but especially down here on sectional doors in South Florida, I got to tell you, we don't even teach the, the, the triangle cut in our neck of the woods. Um, for commercial doors, you know, they have their place and such. But what we find is, is interesting. Out of all the training we did, we found a lot of... Um, and people send me pictures all the time because they know I'm into this stuff. A lot of failures when it comes to trying to cut those triangles in a reinforced sectional door. A combination of, you know, being the, the width and the reinforcement behind it, but also just something happens when you take that saw and turn it on an angle. I don't know what it is. I'm still trying to investigate it, but going up and down is easy. Going left and right, horizontal is not a problem. But I, I got to tell you, I see some interesting things, and I'm sure you all have too. When people start putting that thing on an angle, I don't know what happens. It gets really weird. So uh, we've done a lot of training since then, um, learned a ton of information. Uh, I've been keeping up with your articles, keeping up with the local community on how these things are being constructed. Um, and I got to tell you, I think that we've gotten to a good place. But going back to what I said before, I think it was interesting. I'm wondering where these people learned a lot of these tactics. And, and I know I'm kind of talking a lot here, but I think this is pretty interesting. A lot of people, from what I found, when they go to fire school, they're looking in a text, whether it's IFSTA, NFPA, wh whatever it is. And when they're in the fire school, they're just there to pass the test. They just want to get certified and get in the job. So depending on where they go, they may only see a picture of how to cut a door, and that's it. Now, depending on where they get hired on the department, we'll determine where they go training-wise afterwards. And if they choose to go to other conferences and such, we'll determine what their knowledge base is. But a lot of them, it, interestingly enough, will say, well, I saw a picture in a book and that's what I did. 
And it's interesting that some of the books out there do very different ways in teaching, not only garage door construction versus commercial versus sectional, but on ways to cut through those doors. So the only reason I'm saying this is as a training chief, I no longer assume anything. I got to make sure that we understand or we teach them. This is what we want to see out there because I can't assume what you know. Um, but it was just very interesting seeing where they're, they're learning from. And I found that if you don't give them that direction up front, um, you're going to see some interesting results. But my, one of my goals was just to kind of, especially in the South Florida area, is get away from that triangle cut. And I think we've done a good job of that, especially with the sectional doors. But um, they're a challenge. They're heavily reinforced, continuing to be heavily reinforced. Um, one of the manufacturers I spoke to recently says that in, in Florida, no matter what, no matter where you go, even in the center of the state, they're putting up some sort of reinforcement behind those doors. So, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of wandering on here and everything, but uh, I wonder. That we to tackle. I wonder if we could do this, and and anybody here chime in and see if we can do this. Steve, you know these pictures, okay? We've gone over these pictures. I would like you to narrate them, um, and in, in your words, and so we can impress upon our viewers what, what we're actually talking about. And also that there's two openings that we make. You keep talking about try before you pry. If you can get a sectional door, devoid of any latches on the outside, you know, paint and body shot. If we can cut a small triangle in the second section from the bottom, many times we can reach and pull a sliding latch. But it also gives us an opportunity. Let's see if we can do this. Uh, can, can we go full screen and have Steve do the talking? Okay, so what I'm looking at right there, and this is interesting, looking at that picture, what I've done recently, can you hear me okay there, Chief, uh, Cap? Yeah, is it full screen? That, that's perfect right there. Okay, so there uh, what you got there is a picture. What you got there is a picture of a, a, a large and a nicely sized cut there on one of the sides of a, a sectional garage door, uh, second panel up, going down, and uh, reaching in for a latch right there. Interestingly enough, and, and I think that our, our construction and our, uh, our industry down here is the same as yours in Miami, I asked us a couple streets worth of warehouses how they lock their doors. How are they securing their businesses when they go home at night? And nine times out of 10, all they're doing is lowering that door and putting in a latch, either on one side or the other or both sides. So you're right. If you know your area, if you know your territory and you know this is the, the norm, by all means, a cut like that on one side or maybe both, reaching in, pulling those latches, that door may just open up just like that. It might be as simple as that and resorting to no other cuts needed. And Steve, this gives us an opportunity to determine the location and the dimension of the wind bracing, which is horizontal, and then the vertical is called styles. That's styles, mm -hmm. uh, It also, at this point, uh, if there's fire behind the door, we're gonna stick a nozzle in there, brother. And we're going to put out a yes, sir. as we can. Steve, I'm going to go to the next one. So in this case, we determined that we cannot raise the door. So we're going to have to skin it. Mm -hmm. Do I, am I holding it okay, Steve? Yes, sir. Absolutely. So in this okay. case, the example that you just gave, you got one cut that's already been made down there in the bottom. You got that, that the triangle that you, uh, essentially, it's like an inspection cut that you do on a roof. Yeah. That's what's, what's, what's behind there, the depth what's behind there in, re in, re in relation to uh, the reinforcements behind there. And kind of like you said, if you realize that it's the latch ain't the issue, you already tried to latch and it ain't going up for whatever reason, you already have the start of what could be the next cut, which is either a barn door or a door within a door or a West Coast cut or whatever you want to call it. So you've already started that cut. How's that, All right. Yeah, that's a good picture right there. Um, and I got to tell you, uh, whatchamacallit, um, what I've been teaching, looking at this picture reminds me of a couple things right there. Uh, first off, I know that um, when we're telling people to do these barn door cuts, when they make that first vertical cut going down, a lot of times as they're almost all the way down, if they can push that door and it's still operating as one unit, you know you got some some reinforcement. Bingo. 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 Hmm? Say that again there? Yeah. So Absolutely. yeah, so if you're trying to do the full, let's say you got a 14 inch blade and you got five inches that's cut, and you're going in there and you've buried that blade all the way down and yet at the bottom you're still pushing that door and it's still one piece you know you're going to have to do another cut just to get that um skin off to reach behind there and cut those extra reinforcements it's a great picture you are spot on steve so now here's something 
we can see he's, he's still skinning the door. He's got to be able to expose those wind bracing so he cuts them separately. You know what? This this brings up another, looking at this picture brings me two thoughts. One, I'm looking first off, and this and you're skinning the door right here to get to the reinforcements. Yes, but one thing we found is that because sometimes we don't know how thick those reinforcements are behind there. We used to tell people just to put uh, uh, the skin enough just to get the blade in there, like the the the, uh, the guard in there. But what we found is with a lot more of these reinforced horizontal ones that are sometimes five inches in length and thick, we're telling people now, listen, go from style to style, make that cut pretty large. So when the, the skin drops, you can manipulate that saw a little bit more to develop a little triangle if needed to, which will drop out and then go right through the larger pieces. I'm, you probably have a, a picture of that as well. But also, there you go. Oh, we do it looking there, okay? We're getting there. Uh, what am I? The we're, hitting the, we're hitting a little bit of concrete. All right, so what am I looking at right here? Can you lower that a little bit? Yes, I will. Okay. Right, so yeah. what am I looking at? So the, that one might not be in order, Steve. I'm going to go to the next one because what we're doing, we're getting down to the bottom of the floor now. And okay. No, what I, what I see a lot is, and this this right here, as you're getting to that bottom part of the door, is really where the efficiency of the of the sawyer of the person with the saw is going to come into play. A lot of times, that bottom angle iron, that bottom, whether it's commercial or sectional, that bottom piece of angle iron or bottom piece of metal that holds that door becomes a challenge to the operator. Now, going if you're comfortable with the saw and you're comfortable holding at different angles and you got someone there maybe leveraging it with like a halligan and a roof hook pushing up and you can get to it. It's okay. You got a person. There you go. But what we're finding a lot is, there you go. What we're finding a lot of is if you got a person on that saw and they're not comfortable with it, this takes a long time. This part right here is one of those rate limiting factors. For some reason, they're not sure what to cut. They're making cuts that are inefficient and they got to cut again and again. But that part right there is one of the, the definite rate limiting factors. We try to make sure that we're doing the training, really focus on that to make sure they understand what they're cutting, why they're cutting, how wide they should be cutting, all that kind of jazz. Because that right there just seems to be, the, the, the vertical cuts ain't that bad. One here, one there, but when they get to that bottom part, it seems to be something that just happens where they're not familiar with how it's all put together down there. But I will tell you also, uh, one of the comments I get so often um, when we're talking about the sectional doors and like the old triangle cut is, they're like, Steve, I, I get to get water in the fire. I've been taught to do a triangle. And I, I don't disagree, but looking at that cut right there, um, at least what we're telling our folk right here is a good tactic is if you just drop those two vertical cuts right there and those skin falls out, well, you have a whole little section where you can flow water while the guy, the, oh, there you go. So if you have the guy holding the nozzle and they're fighting the fire, they can go top, bottom, left, right, whatever have you, and the other person is left out of the way to complete. So that kind of is, at least in my mind, and I'd love to hear the feedback, a lot better than someone putting a hole in the middle where that person's just operating, trying to cut, maybe finding some reinforcement, they're right in the middle of the door. It, this seems to be, at least from my vantage point, a better, a better option. So the one person with the lines on the side on their own and the Sawyer can finish their job. And Steve, would you mention, that you don't expect a young firefighter to tell you, uh, hey chief, I'm tired, let somebody else rotate in. Uh, the first indication that they're fatigued cutting over their head is gonna be that the blade is gonna bind. And then I, I, I know myself, I'm drilled. I start out ambitious like this. And then by the time I'm at the other end of the door, it looks like a bell curve of my love life. It started out up here and ooh, right <laughs> down to the bottom. So, um, <laughs> finish up with this yep yeah, that's that's a beautiful beautiful finished up barn door cut or a door within a door or whatever you want to call it that's a beautiful uh, end of the day right there <laughs> if i can say a couple things here as soon as you encounter a heavy door or a situation like this get on the horn and let the ic know that yes we can get water on the fire but getting a large opening in this door, it does, it takes a lot of time compared to a, a, a much thinner door. Steve, you were absolutely right about the natural gyroscope. Uh, and this is an overhead rolling door. Uh, it wants to cut up and down. 
And if we can take a slice down one end, we might get lucky and get the chain. Now, that's not always possible, but at least we've begun our cuts. Now, if you have slats, and, and also, could you describe our wind, wind locks that we have on overhead rolling doors here, Steve? Sure. Um, so what we have, and I have a whole box of them actually, but I left the box at home by mistake today. I have a whole box of the uh, the wind tabs that you find at the end of those doors, especially down here. And what they'll have is in the channels, inside the the, 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 the channels that go open down to hold the doors in place, there'll be an extra piece of metal that sits there that allows the wind tab to actually sit in place. And what we found is cutting a bunch of these doors that some hold better than others. In other words, even if there's a wind tab there, with the wind bar it's called it will hold them pretty tight some don't so you might be able to pull them out even if there's a wind tab there but if they're not if they're in there and they're pretty tight those ain't going to come out that's what it's designed for so I, i've had hit i've had mixed uh, uh, experiences with that but um in, in general in just as we'll keep behind that wind bar and keep that slat from sliding out all right and then this picture says a thousand words um we Listen, diamond blades are remarkable, and they're very durable. But if you overheat them and you cut faster than the saw wants to cut, it will come apart. And if it can go through that blade guard, it'll go through your flesh. And your first indication is that you're stalling the saw out. Every so often, if you see the blade getting red hot, back it off. The reason that there's, I don't know what you want to call them, flutes or those those grooves in there is to cool off that um cool off that uh, that that well we call it a blade but steve you know that it's not a blade it's a cutting disc it's a cutting disc steve uh any final thoughts before we move to camp mike i want to talk to mike specifically about roll down security gates anything else steve before we move on no no and i'm, I'm sorry if i'm talking so specific to south florida it's kind of no, what i know it's no, exactly what i wanted to do yeah um we just really saw an issue we tackled it as hard as we could try to come up with the best practices and um you know it's something that i'm very passionate about i'm just thank you for letting me uh, chat a little bit on something i'm, well, I'm kind I'm of really on. and this that's the beauty of this hangout so i'm going to give a shout out to key hose right now and um that's keyhose.com again um <laughs> These guys keep sending these messages here while I'm, I'm trying to be serious here. Keyhose.com. Uh, kinks are firefighter killers. Don't go cheap on hose. Uh, take a look at uh, all of their uh, lines. They have different grades of hose. Uh, their top of the line, the combat ready, admittedly, is not cheap. But don't go cheap on hose. And if you're looking to replace hose or you want to uh, change up for your high rise, your uh, standpipe operations, remember that there isn't just that inch and three quarter and two and a half decision anymore. Get out and flow it and try it with the different nozzles. Uh, Daryl, when we get to you, I know we're not talking fire streams today, but uh, there's a uh, there's a new animal out there, and uh, I don't know if it's going to work, but um, uh the um inch and three sixteenth. Captain Mike, Captain Mike, can you tell us in your experience with storefront roll down security gates? I mean you've I'm sure you learned one way and then through the course of your career um refine those ways. And uh I really think that it would be it's very important and very beneficial for all of us to get uh, the perspective of somebody on the FDNY that has forced dozens and dozens of doors in their in their career. Well, the first thing, Bill, is that great picture you had of that saw. If you got an engine company standing by and you see your blade getting red hot, have the nozzle man cool the saw blade. Have the nozzle man call for him to squirt it with a little bit of a broken stream. Just cool the blade. Okay? It makes it put water on the door. The other thing is cutting the door. It depends on the door. You have to know your area. Uh, we used to have the American um, 2000 hockey puck lock. And we found out we could shear them with a pipe wrench. We got an aluminum pipe wrench, a 24-inch aluminum pipe wrench, and a breaker bar, and we'd snap them off. Well, of course, 
the local um, entrepreneurs in some of the areas I worked saw us do this, and they went out and got their own pipe wrench and were breaking into the stores. So there are different ways to do the gates. You have to know your gates. I would never know how to do a gate in South Florida. But in my roll downs, where I used to teach my guys the best way to do it for us is above the locks, you put two holes with a halligan, with the pike and a halligan, two holes in the same slat. Then cut a line between those two slats. Put the halligan back in, have a guy with the axe hit it, bang, one side is out, other side, bang, the other side's out. Now you can raise it up, and the engine can have the access to the entire ceiling in the storefront. The triangle, again, works, but it gives the engine a limited amount of area to work in with that nozzle. So you want to make sure these things. The other thing is, be careful. I one time was going into a store, into a large warehouse-type building, where I started climbing in over the cut in the triangle, and somebody had gotten inside before me and started hitting all the buttons to open up the doors. Well, the door was now going up with Michael caught in the door. Uh, not a good thing. We have to be very careful when we're doing this stuff. And also, if you're going to roll this door up and you've now got a cut piece, you have to be careful you don't drop it back down on top of us. Figure out what you're going to do. Know your doors. And the other really weird one that I had only a couple of experiences with, but it's very, is the uh, almost like the chain link fence gate inside the store. Now, the one I was at, we couldn't get the saw to run because it was too smoky to get inside that building. We have to figure out, you have to pre-plan this, know where the keyway is. We had guys who knew how to jump those things and could open up the gates from the outside keyways. They were brilliant. They used to bring the screw gun and pull them out and know how to jump them and get them. That's great. Know your buildings. Know your doors. Know what you are going to encounter in your area and go out and work with your people and see how you're going to force them. Uh, Bill Carey, if you're watching, uh, there was an article in the web, and it may have been in a magazine again, uh, written by a, a firefighter, I believe in Washington, D.C., and his last name is Troxel. Um, at, to a T, the pictures completely describe, you just described, Mike, exactly what his article shows with the two uh, holes, and you do it before you cut the door. Like before a you make any cut. cut. If you don't do it before the cut, Bill, you're not going to be able to get the hole in there. You have to leave the, the gate secured. Yes, yes. And, and Bill, if you're watching, um, or, or Bobby, uh, it's a, uh, it was a few years ago. Uh, again, the fellow's name is Troxel from Washington, D.C., I believe. Uh, it was on the fire engineering webpage. And um, if we can get that back up uh, and resurrect that, it is perfect for what you just described, uh, Captain Mike. Thank you. Jason, any thoughts, any experiences, sir? Now, uh, where I where I'm at, luckily we don't have a lot of those big heavy doors. We're we're primarily a bedroom community, so we we deal a lot of residential, which have their own problems. But for the most part, with a, with a lot of the basic tactics and and uh, strategies that you use, we get in most of them. Quite honestly, our biggest concern with the roll up doors we have is typically finding a man door right away and protecting the interior barrier on these residential garages. We don't have the big heavy industrial complexes or manufacturing plants where um, we've got those. We do have a few storage buildings, but again, most of the stuff we're dealing with is lightweight. One thing we have started to see, and, and I see this mostly on like basements where they'll park a golf cart or they'll pull a lawnmower in, is some of the real lightweight stuff's got Teflon wheels. Um, they're, they're real lightweight, and if that stuff melts, you can't lift it or, or do anything with it, even if you do unlock it. I want to show this picture again. Uh, now, this happens to be an industrial occupancy, that was, and they put an office in there. But uh, we're going to have to, an American fire service is going to have to change the way they're thinking because this is not just a, uh, an urban issue. Uh, how many of us have homes in our, uh, our communities uh, that were built as a single family home and now um, are housing multiple families? Uh, we have areas of Miami-Dade County that, I'm not exaggerating when I say every, every house. Every house has at least one residential occupancy in the garage 
and we've been transmitting a, uh, an, uh, a primary search completed without searching that garage. We have got to stop that uh, because that is not unusual at all to start cutting on a garage door and then have a, a, uh, um, an office or something behind there. Uh, Daryl, uh, any thoughts? Yeah, um, I have a couple of questions uh, for some of the panelists first. Uh, first, Steve, since uh, you've had so much practice, uh, do you have comments between the aluminum oxide blade or the diamond blade since you have so much heavy cutting to do? My department uh, mostly uses the aluminum oxide, but each ladder company has recently got diamond blades as well. Yeah, what I'll say in that is uh, in the Broward County area, requesting what kind of saws they carried, or I'm sorry, blades they carried. And I don't think anybody was actually carrying the aluminum oxide blades anymore. Everybody was carrying some form of those diamond cutting blades, whether it was, I don't mention any of the, the specific, specific names, but it seems like out of the 18 departments, we had like 12 different types of those kind of diamond cutting blades. And what I noticed is as you go north in the state, um, there was a little bit more prevalence of those uh, blades present, but down here, uh, I think we pretty much eliminated those. Um, so that's just the, my experience of down here. They're still used, but just not as much as they once were. All right, thanks. Yeah, I, I have limited experience with it, but I just found that the aluminum oxide seems to uh, cut uh, faster, but they whittle down pretty fast and the diamond blade works. Uh, you know, it, it works for a much longer period of time. Agreed. And that was my that was my major concern about the death, especially with the. If you want to access uh, Danny Troxel's article, it's a firefighter training drill. Just go to the fire engineering website. There's a little search box up at the top of it, and you can enter the outboard forcible entry saw. That's the outboard O U T B O A R D the outboard forcible entry saw, or you can enter Danny, T-R-O-X-E-L-L, -L, Danny, T-R-O-X-E-L-L, -L, and that'll pull up the article for you. It's a great article. Danny did it in 2004. And uh, right what on. he's referring to with the outboard saw is, that, and my company did the same. I'm sure you, Captain Mike, the same thing. One of our saws, we turned the cutting arm around. Now, sometimes you have to cut upside down but we could cut uh, barrel bolts down in the bottom of the door uh, that are anchored into the uh, door jam. Um, uh, we could get up real close inside of a recessed door. Uh, and of course you can run the saw upside down. It's got a little pickup tube on it. Fellas, um, I gotta t I'm really excited about something here. Uh, you were talking, Captain Mike, about uh, running these saws in the smoke. Uh, not to endorse any product, but I'm gonna. Because I like, you know how women buy shoes that they don't need? Men buy tools that they don't need. So have any of you guys seen the DeWalt uh, battery powered? It looks like a mini K-12 saw. I got it. I have no use for it. But man, I am buying one. I'm going to sit in my living room and just run that thing. Because it exudes, it exudes testosterone. I gotta have one of those things. If you haven't seen it, Steve, have you had your hands on it? Okay, so I, I saw it. I, I did some research at a recent fire convention, Fire Rescue East over here in, in Daytona recently. Even the vendors haven't had a chance to play with it too much. Even the guys that I respected, uh, some of the, the same people that I've gotten from you, uh, even they haven't had a chance to play with them much yet. I, from what I understand, uh, oh, what size blade did they have? It was only a smaller blade, maybe eight inches maybe, um, but with the technology from our extrication tools and a bunch of other things going towards battery powered stuff, I have a feeling we're going to see a lot more of this coming up. Yeah. I have a uh, feeling it'd be pretty yeah. good at cutting chain link fences. It, it would be. And Daryl uh, agreed. Uh, we used to keep a uh, aluminum oxide blade uh, for an impalement because uh, you know, somebody falls on a section of rebar stuck in a footing. Uh, the, the aluminum oxide will go through the uh, the rebar quicker than any diamond blade. And, uh, and you mentioned the, the downside, of course, is you lose your depth of cut as we're losing our uh, our, our, our diameter of the blade. Um, 
But don't think for a minute, again, I showed you that picture. Don't think that diamond, uh, I, we call them blades, but they're not. They're discs, technically. Uh, but uh, there is still a place, I do believe, for aluminum oxide, uh, those aluminum oxide blades, uh, uh, discs. I, I think one of them is when you're cutting the hasp of a, uh, like an American 2000 Captain Mike, brother, uh, where you're, uh, you're trying to expose that cavity in the middle of the lock. And Bill, one of the things that we carried on the rig, we had two of them, were rebar cutters, battery powered rebar cutters, which will work in the smoke on those gates that people have inside the store so they can see through them, will work on the lock hasp, will work on the fence and other things. So knowing your tools, because we also use them a lot for window gates. When we went into some of these buildings where they were burglar proofed on the outside, having a rebar cutter, having the guy going around the rear, bringing a rebar cutter over his shoulders, he could cut the gates on the windows when he got up there. So it's just a versatile tool. You got to know how to use it and how to turn the head and everything else. Different manufacturers out there, but they're a great tool to think about for doing some of these things. Well, you know, now that you mention it, well, thank you very much. Now I got to go out and get myself a rebar cutter in, a, in addition to it. Not that I'll ever use it, but, you know, I uh, got to have one of those too. Uh, Chief Bobby, any any comments, any thoughts so far? No, I you know, <clears throat> the number one takeaway so far is, you know, know your area. You know, Steve started off by talking to us about, you know, what he's seeing down there. But as, as we look at some of these, you know, new taxpayers that are coming out there, these uh, platform buildings where you've got the, the, the bodega kind of businesses and such, and then the condos up above it for four and five stories, the fire problem is immense, as we all know, because it's you know usually a non-combustible base and then four, three or four or five stories of all wood. But add to that, that now you're gonna have these access issues because unlike your standard you know, fire in a, in a uh, you know, multifamily, now you've got the multifamily element with the commercial element down below. So whether or not you had a downtown prior to this where you had a lot of roll up door issues, you're seeing them on all of these new construction uh, places. And uh, I've been looking at, you know, collecting pictures and, and such on them just because there's such a proliferation of them. And exactly what Steve was talking about, and Mike was talking about, the roll-up doors that they're using there, uh, they're, they're, they're an additional layer of security. And, and the, the way that they're built in to the structure is, is impressive. And, and defeating them is going to take the right tools, the right training, and, 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 and focus. So, uh, you know, everybody has said it very well. Uh, uh, Danny's article does a great job. And, uh, you know, please take a look at that. Uh, Danny Troxel, uh, please take a look at his piece on fire engineering. That does a great job of talking about it. But, uh, you know, the, the folks who build these doors, it's just like every other product, right? There's, the, there's always a new iteration, a new model, a better model. And, and defeating that better model requires you know a better prepared firefighter so uh, and, and what also was interesting to me was the discussion about the battery operated tools you know the battery operated tools today that the folks are putting out are, are phenomenal and incredibly powerful and, and useful and, and the fact that they're you know usable in an environment where you can't access air great 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 thing to remember you know, your, your, your tools that require uh, ambient air to function because of their combustion engines, uh, you know, may fail you in some of these environments where your battery powered tools are going to continue to work. So, so some really great stuff. Thank you. Well, that's great. And you know, Steve did the right things. Steve is spot on. If you want to know how to take apart these doors, you got to know how they go, go together. Steve went to the manufacturer, uh, to his credit. And uh, so not only is his hygiene excellent, but he's also an astute guy when it comes to door construction. He went to a, um, uh, by the way, Steve, the amount of gel that you have in your hair, how fast in a convertible could you drive before it would get mussed up? Well, <laughs> let me just give you a piece of background on Steve's hair, actually. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about that incredibly powerful new saw. It was designed specifically so that barbers could cut that part for Steve when he was just kidding. And if you get to FDIC, 
uh, our good friends at DeWalt, who are major supporters of ours, will be there, and you'll be able to put your hands on that very sauce. So, and you can get to watch Steve, you know, get a haircut with it, which is amazing. I will get you a picture of me with the saw, and I'll make sure to send it to you there, Cap. Oh, that's great, Steve. That's great, Jason. Any uh, final uh, again? I want to. I want to congratulate you, Jason. You know we're. Uh, uh, you know we're good friends, and uh, and by the way, Jason, we will. Uh, We'll be setting a place for Greg at our table for the building construction nerds at FDIC uh, for our brother Greg. And uh, but um, I just uh, I'm proud to know you, Jason. Uh, for you to become that you're a relatively young guy. What are you I like? Twenty one, twenty two now. Twenty five. Uh, and uh, you're now the chief of that department. Uh, very qualified and deserving. It's great to see you back, Jason. And uh, I hope. Uh, the department is very lucky to have a chief like you. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you. It means a lot. Uh, Daryl, any final thoughts here before we sign off? Yeah. Um, I just changed uh, engine companies. I was just recently in a, in a district that uh, was primarily warehouses. And the reason I'm mentioning this is it really depends how you're getting, you know, why are we going after these doors in the warehouse area? Uh, my main move was mainly we needed just to get in the building if forcible entry was required. And um, if your jurisdiction required, uh, allows you to have knock box keys or some type of keys, just get out there and make sure that those are available because uh, sometimes we do need to uh, have an easier route than cutting these doors. If it did require forcible entry into a man door, um, a lot of times you can open these roll-up doors from inside because high rack storage is often blocking these roll-up doors. In the district I, I am in now, it's mostly storefront roll-up doors with uh, living space above. I've got a tremendous amount of that where there is generally no man door and the rear doors are heavily secured. So cutting or uh, prying these doors is pretty much the only option. And um, I think that triangle cut, we still teach that. I still think it's a very fast way to start getting water in the overhead, just as you're starting to make that second cut. But if water's not ready, don't, don't connect that because we don't just want a rush of air getting in there until water's ready. But another tool, if you don't have for those storefront doors, look at getting some type of lock puller or Rex tool. Under fire conditions, it's still a very, very fast uh, tool to pull that lock and open up that glass and frame door. Oh, one more thing. If you're gonna start pulling flats, make sure the pike of your halogen is nice and sharp. You gotta take a pretty strong baseball bat swing to get that hole in that door. So keep that pike sharp. I hear you. I hear you. You know, the re I think I told you the reason I'm dressed like this is I will put off to the last day to get my picture taken for uh, which is mandatory. So I'm probably going to get myself in trouble. But, but the, my point is, is that firefighters are huge procrastinators. If you intend on going to FDIC, especially if you're going to participate in the hot program, man, you got to get signed up now. Okay, you cannot put it off. They're just too popular. They're too sought after, and they fill up extremely fast. So uh, it's get going on it. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, if you procrastinate, you're either not going to be able to go to any hot class at all or you're not going to get your first choice. OK, so please don't put it off uh, because it's going to be here before you know it. Uh, I think we had it. You know, Daryl, we didn't even talk about strategy. I mean, why are we going through an overhead door rather than a swinging door? And, and in many cases in my area, it's because uh, you have a warehouse bay that has a uh, it, the swinging door opens up to a poorly constructed wood frame shack, which is the office or the showroom. It's air conditioned. The rest of the building is not. So I'm not saying we wouldn't force that swinging door for uh, to uh, direct a stream, uh, but I'm not going in there with a hose line uh, because you have literally have tons of, they make the roof of these things, the top of these things, a storage mezzanine. You can get into that. The overhead door almost always is going to lead, I contradicted myself with that wall, but almost always is going to lead to a, some type of aisle. 
main aisle where you can use the reach of, of uh, a two and a half or a, a, a portable master stream device uh, and get back in there and also cool off those steel bar joists to uh, uh, prevent them or uh, delay their, their collapse. Looks like we're right up against the clock. Again, thank you, Key. I love your hose. I got my hands on it every day, literally. And uh, I'm proud to endorse it because I use it. I'm manager of our department's uh, two-inch hose standpipe project. And uh, I stand by it. And again, kink resistance in small spaces. You better have hose with great kink resistance. You can't be key. Till next month. One more thing, Bill. All right, my brothers. God bless you all. I got to go get my picture taken. God Bill, bless one you more all. Thing. all right. One more yes, thing. The early yeah. bird for FDIC ends next week. If you want to save money for yourself or your department, the early bird pricing, it goes up after next week. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you, Captain Mike. All right. Then uh, till next month, brothers and sisters, uh, especially Steve and uh, Derek, uh, thank you so much for participating and stay safe. We'll see you next month.